Today we're going to move north and talk about the Baroque in Central Europe, and particularly we're going to talk about how the legacy and the spatial devices of Guarino Guarini were received in a northern climate. Baroque manifests itself in different ways in different countries. In Italy, we saw that the Baroque was an extension of the classical language of architecture, and it gained its characteristic expression through these elaborate counterpuntal concatenations of different rhythms, different surfaces, different ideas about how an articulation or an order was marked. And as we went farther north, and farther north could even mean Turin, the Turin of Guarino Guarini, the language became less knowable from, from the point of view of classical sources, and more and more particularized, often based on the superposition of different forms that resulted in a kind of weird-looking form that could be traced back to some kind of provenance, but, ten but tended to be curvilinear and almost vegetal in the way forms unfolded, like leaves or like vines. And as you continue moving north, particularly moving north into Bavaria, let's say, or m moving north into Austria, this predilection for vegetal forms or for the asymmetrical and the curvilinear begins to take over, so much so that all memory of the tectonic is more or less lost or at least suppressed by the time we get to the Rococo. As we mentioned last time, Guarini's work found very little resonance in Italy. People returned back toward a more conventional classical language. Architects like Yuvara, for example, exemplify that return toward a language of classical architecture. Let's look at this drawing that we showed last time, which is more or less a field of circles. It's a strange idea for a plan, but in many ways, the space that Guarini operates in is an extensible field of potentialized circles that can be activated upon as a single center that then begins to sponsor a elaborated perimeter, or it can be acted on in a serial fashion so that longitudinal churches can be shaped out of the intersection and the overlap of domed spaces. For example, here in Santa Maria della Divina Providenza in Lisbon, we see an example of the latter strategy, the strategy adopted for longitudinal churches. A center, a center, a center, a center, and even the perimeter becomes a series of ovalized spaces, as if they somehow genetically derive from the centric space. We also saw that Guarini played fast and loose with the language of architecture. If we look at the section here, we'll see the repertoire of forms are not things that could have been pulled from an archaeological visit to the Roman Forum. Things like little classical eticules, even simple geometric forms derived from a platonic idea about what counts as ideal. Squares, circles, rectangles with ideal proportional systems. But instead, these two seem to be free form and driven by some kind of idea about either natural form or the superimposition of different forms that yield something complex. It's also possible to say that some of the oddness of Guarini's work comes from the fact that Guarini, in many ways, is the most modern character that we've looked at so far. Unlike other provincial architects, whose work was really limited to, say, Tuscany if they're a Florentine, or Lazio if they're a Roman, or if they're an exceptional character like Alberti, maybe, maybe moving up and down a couple of hundred miles in either direction. But Guarini traveled far and wide as a papal legate and has built work all over, in Portugal, in France, in Bohemia, in Sicily, in northern Italy. And so some of the images that get folded into Guarini's work are surprising. For example, here we see a kind of eclecticism coming into play, where Islamic sources, such as the Mirhad Dome and the Great Mosque of Cordoba, could have been used to inform something like Guarini's Dome at San Lorenzo in Turin. We see this overlapping, interlacing, eight-pointed star of ribs that reminds us very much of what we saw in Cordoba, with the exception that Guarini is structurally more risk-taking than the, the architects in Cordoba and he begins to pull his dome toward the vertical and make possible elaborate perforation to let light rake in. There's a sense of awe. There's a sense of the overwhelming quality of a space that cannot be understood rationally in Guarini's work. And it seems as though some of that is coming from his ability to examine and fold in certain values that one would get from Islamic and Gothic sources. The idea of the rib, the idea of the basket weave, the idea of pattern that becomes three-dimensional and becomes inundated with light. 
We see here the dome of his space is a paraboloid. When we move north, some of the impulses we already saw in Guarini really take a final form, or at least become documentable. This is a work by Fischer von Erlach, a Austrian, and it's got a fancy German title, which basically means Treatise on Historical Architecture. This is a funny title. When we were looking at the Renaissance, there was a certain obsession, you might say, with the historical, but it was a very focused idea of history. History was something that could be retrieved by looking at classical antiquity, and classical antiquity was solely contained on Roman soil. They didn't even look at Greece. They looked at Roman antiquity as the source from which the truths could be pulled. And suddenly, Fischer von Erlach, at the beginning of the 18th century, is writing a treatise and looking at as many different historical architectures as possible. He's looking far and wide, and it's not that he's necessarily traveled to these places. To a large extent, Fischer von Erlach's understanding of historical architecture comes from literary descriptions. Literary descriptions that are being sent back by missionaries, like Jesuit priests, literary descriptions from old sources like Herodotus. And so we find things, okay, lots of temples, even exotic-looking temples, but even things that seem really unbelievable, at least unbelievable in terms of the kinds of sources architects were looking at before. The Colossus of Rhodes, I don't know if it was really a giant man holding in his lap a little village. The Temple of Diana at Ephesus, these are still sort of classical, but look over here. Over here we have the Temple of Olympian Zeus, which you might say Fischer von Erlach got wrong insofar as there would not have been a barrel vault in a Greek structure. However, here we see something quite unusual. It's a little pagoda. And this is not the only example of a little pagoda in the works of Fischer von Erlach. Here we have four Chinese views, pagoda, a gateway, and some amazing landscapes. Look at this bridge. Look at this rockery. The repertoire of possibilities is increasing. And also, if you see things like the twisted form of this rockery, it is not so very symmetrical, is it? The idea that natural form and the variability of natural form could become a source, if not for building planning, then at least for ornament, is an opportunity introduced by this wide-ranging eclecticism, or at least this wide-ranging engagement with history ushered in by Fischer von Erlach. Pyramids, nice. Hagia Sophia. Big Pagoda in Nanjing. So what Fischer von Erlach is doing with his treatise on historical architecture is really opening up a level playing field and saying, when we look for precedent, it's no longer the case that there is only one source that we can look at. It's no longer the case that the architecture of classical antiquity is privileged above all other architectures, but rather we can we can be eclectic. We can pull, we can put together, we can pick and choose, we can make new things happen based on the meanings we want to express. Let's see how this translates into Fischer von Erlach's own work. Here we have the Karlskirche. This is Fischer von Erlach's most famous church, his most important church. And it's a church on the outskirts of the city walls of Vienna. It was built to commemorate the end of a plague, but it was also built to commemorate the triumph of the Austrian forces against the forces of the Ottoman Empire. The forces were at the very gates of Vienna, and a siege took place there for a long period of time. Have you, have you ever wondered why you drink coffee? Have you ever wondered why you eat croissants? Well, to a large extent, that has to do with this moment in history, when the Turks were at the gates of Vienna. And if you're being besieged by a Turkish army, you get very sleepy. and You smell this delicious thing that the Turks are drinking, and you think, ooh, I want some of that. So coffee drinking was initiated at this period as, as something common in Europe, although it had caught on in the Middle East before. And also, croissants were cooked by the bakers of Vienna, or at least so it is said. These little crescent-shaped pastries that were the symbol of the Ottoman Empire, the crescent. And when you ate the crescent-shaped pastry, you were symbolically vanquishing your foe by devouring its symbol. And it makes a delicious breakfast. Let's look at the architecture of Fischer von Erlach. It's a strange plan, isn't it? You look at this thing and you have to say, wow, it barely hangs together. We see here something like a wall, almost completely detached from the volume of the building. If you think about the particular site of this building, at the edge of the city of, of Vienna, it makes a lot of sense that it would have a plan like this. 
It's a billboard, really, seen from far away. So it projects its image in a rhetorical Baroque fashion. We know the facade doesn't necessarily need to adhere to the building, but this is the most extreme detachment that we've seen yet. The facade of the building seems to completely detach from the volume of the building. And this is something we've seen in the Roman Baroque, particularly in works by Borromini, where the detachment and slippage of the facade from the volume of the building seems to be thematic. Here in the case of Fischer von Erlach, it really seems as though there's an interest in pumping this thing up to the biggest scale possible so that from within the walls of Vienna, you can look back at this and you read it in all its glory. It does seem like a kind of eclectic assortment of pieces, e even, even more radically eclectic than the pieces at Uvara's La Superga. For example, okay, we have ourselves a little classical temple, we have ourselves a Roman Baroque dome, but what are these things? What do these things look like? Any takers? Yes. They look exactly like Trajan's columns. Trajan only had one. Now we have two. So what does it look like when you have two tall pointy things flanking a religious building? It kind of looks like minarets. It kind of looks like they're taking another symbol of vanquished foe and claiming it as their own. So with these Trajanic columns that are now not talking about Trajan's conquests, but the victory over the Turks, they're kind of modeling the Turkish architecture of minarets and making it their own. If you look at the plan, it seems really kind of similar to the strategy that we saw in uh, La Superga. And that is, you take a nine square grid and you begin to just explode the thing, or you begin to disembowel the nine square grid in such a way that pieces individuate themselves and take on different qualities. So we have some idea of an ideal condition over here and a displaced cell over here and then a kind of marker of an edge that's completely moved away from volume and become surface. The plan is almost more schizophrenic in its collection of different types and different sources than the elevation where we see the facade pull forward almost as an autonomous billboard behind which the church exists. And it's kind of interesting to look at, say, Fischer von Erlach's Karlskirche versus Borromini's San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane. In both cases, there's a superposition of an oval and a cross. And in the case of the Borromini, there's still this Roman Baroque impulse towards synthesizing, toward taking these complex forms and forging a new thing. In the case of, of San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane, a squashed ovalized jelly bean. But a thing these undulating surfaces that connect everything together. Here, it seems like Fischer von Erlach is happy to let you see the dissonance in the system. Happy and, in fact, insistent that you read the different symbols and that there can be no confusion about the fact that this is a sign of the church, this is a sign of the great vault of heaven, this is a sign of the cross, and so forth. All of these symbols are autonomous and superimposed and legible. The plan is also incredibly eclectic, or let's say the plan is a superposition of multiple plan types. On one level, we see centralized church, but this is a centralized church that has been extended in a longitudinal way. We also see here centralized church superimposed by cruciform church. Now, in the case of Roman Baroque, we had a similar idea that an ovalized church plan and a cruciform plan were superimposed. But in that case, there was a synthesis into a new form. It seems here as though Fischer von Erlach is happy to allow you to see the disruption or the disjunction between these different forms. And you might even say it's a serial cruciform plan of a cross and a cross and a cross and a cross as you move back through this church along the axis into the various spaces forms that are derived from chinoiserie, from Chinese so, sources, from porcelain. So the section is really great. It's a really, really tall church. This Baroque trick of a large drum to elevate the dome as high as possible so it can be seen at a great distance is going on here too. So too is the technique of a double dome, where a dome with a fairly shallow slope is perceived from the underside and a taller slope is perceived from above. What's really cool about the dome is that for the last, let's say, 
seven years or so, they've been restoring the fresco painting on the ceiling. And you can climb up the scaffolding. Actually, you can take an elevator up to the top of the scaffolding and walk on this little rickety surface, 10 feet underneath or even less, underneath the surface of the dome and see the frescoes close up. And if you ever go to Vienna, it's something you absolutely should do because at a certain point you start taking for granted the fact that there are paintings up on the ceiling. But in fact, it's a miracle that there are paintings up on the ceiling. It's a miracle in several senses. One, people have to be way up there painting them. And two, people have to play with perspective in really precise ways to allow those images to be perceived from a very low vantage point and to still make sense. And let's even say three, painting things on a curved surface is different from painting things on a flat surface. So there is a virtuoso of perspectival space being depicted on these things. And, and at the Karlskirche in Vienna, you have a chance to appreciate that magnificent. In Fischer von Erlach's Karlskirche, we still get something that seems fairly closely related to the Roman Baroque in terms of its plasticity, in terms of the clarity of what the pieces are. We can call this a Corinthian pilaster. We can call this a pediment. We can call this a niche carved into the wall. As we move farther into this period, the language becomes increasingly less plastic. Let's look at Another building by Fischer von Erlach, or rather let's look at a palace and the palace gardens of Schloss Schönbrunn in Vienna. Schloss, by the way, is just the German word for country palace. It's sometimes translated as castle, but I don't think that does a very good job because this is certainly not fortified. This is not some kind of castle clothes used for protection, but rather it is a country palace of leisure out in the gardens and more about opening itself up to the landscape than hunkering down, as one would think a castle might do. By now we're familiar with this kind of plan, the plan of Baroque Palace. The essential lineaments of the Baroque Palace plan are to make this strong difference between figural void at the point of entry, courtyard, and figural object addressing the axis of the garden. By this point, everybody is trying to be Louis XIV. Everybody is trying to do a little Versailles. And here, Fischer von Erlach at Schloss Schönbrunn is no different. Look at the axis, wham, moving down moving down into space, but not simply moving down into space, this idea of displaced center, the idea of constantly fixing you and reorienting you to the point that you've been at before is played out here quite systematically. This is the garden facade of the Schloss Schönbrunn. We're looking down an axis, connecting it into the city of Vienna. Magnificent. Notice how the building begins to pavilionize, a little chunk of it pops out, to address the garden axis, and even the corners begin to individuate themselves with their own rhythm of columniation and their own expression and separation from the wall of the building. It's this little element which you can barely see here, and it's marked here in plan. It's called the Gloriette, and it's almost like a wall of the castle, the wall of the Schloss, that's been pulled into the garden. So if you have a desire to think that there's a kind of deformation of tugging, pulling along the axis, the bar bends up, pulls along the axis, and even that bar bends up and pulls along the axis, there's an incredible tension between the gloriette, which is the dimension of this facade, and this facade, as you see a piece of the building hurled into the landscape. Hurled into the landscape in a transparent way, so that rather than terminating your view, it allows the view to pass through. Great. Also notice this. This is quite a shakaru. This is an interior from Schloss Schönbrunn. And look at the language here. This is quite a different language than the language we saw even at the Karlskirche. Because one of the things that the Baroque does is continues the program of classical language, although in a more highly concatenated, elaborated fashion. And one thing that classical architecture does is articulate and express the tectonic system of the building. Tectonic system, of course, means the constructional system, the constructional logic of the building. A lot of classical ornament is aimed at showing you the constructional logic is. We can see that in the Gloriette. We can see columns, we can see arches, and we understand this elaborated moment of the column capital and the impost block as having to do with providing sufficient structure for this system. If we look down here at this interior space, 
It seems as though the ornament is more aimed at obscuring connection rather than revealing connection. This gold leaf curly cue ormolu stuff begins to creep above the cornice and creep down in a way that seems like a veil or a, a layer of, of disguise that the architecture is wearing. Even the idea of the wall seems less about plasticity and carving and more about framing and flattening. There are these exaggerated frames that seem to say the wall is no different from a picture hung on the wall. Here's another interior from Schloss Schönbrunn, and we can see this same language that we saw in that earlier view, the idea of the flattening, the idea of the disguise of the ornamental properties through these gratuitous asymmetrical curly cues that go on everywhere. This is the beginning of a moment that we might call Rococo. More about that later. Just want to show you one more fabulous early 18th century building in Vienna, and this is Upper Belvedere Palace, really not so far from Karls Kirsche, also outside the historical city wall, very dramatic pavilionization of center, pavilionization of corner, and it's quite a narrow, quite a small palace, and it gets its grandeur by really pumping up the scale of certain moments, like look at the stair, great. This is kind of Guarini-esque, or something like that, where a dome begins to detach itself from a re rectangular space and coagulate in the middle so that you can simultaneously read the rectangular volume of the room and the ovalized volume of the dome in the center. There's also this great moment in the stairs where you have these giant herms, these human figures trapped in stone holding up the vaults. Magnificent. A lot of this shift in language as we move into the 18th century has been given a name, and the name is Rococo. Rococo is one of those style names, like Baroque or like Gothic, that was originally applied in a pejorative sense, to say, eh, what is this stuff? Rocaille, the French word for Rococo, means shell work. Rococo represents this kind of shell work. Everything looks curly cuey like a shell. Everything looks decorative. Not so much about structure, more about ornament for the sake of ornament. In the history of the word Rococo is this idea that it is purely decorative, purely additive, purely frivolous. A couple of terms to note. One is the word stucco, and stucco has to do with this plaster work. I mean, stucco is plaster, quite frankly, but in the 18th century in, in northern countries, Germany, Austria, Bohemia, stucco plaster work as a method of architectural ornament became highly developed, and we see some of it here in the Upper Belvedere Palace, where all of this kind of elaborated surface decoration comes, again, not through structure, but through something which is, by its very nature, secondary, adhered to a different material, and that is the plaster, the stucco. By stucco, I mean it's not real material, it's not stone, it's not marble, it's not even wood, it's just all surface. And stucco has the potential to be smooth or to be frothed up into a pink little angel. It's all the same material. Also, you have the idea of the fresco. We saw the fresco when we were looking at Renaissance and Baroque architecture in Italy. We saw it in the Sistine Chapel. We saw it in the Barberini Palace with a magnificent Pietro da Cortona frescoed ceiling. And we see it here, too, as cello aperto, as an open ceiling, where the fresco work typically takes as its point of departure the notion of extending the architectural space of the room. Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel is very clear about the ontological distinction between paintings on the ceiling and the space of the chapel below. But already in Pietro da Cortona's Barberini Chapel, there's a blurring. There's a sense that the room is opening up and people are flying up out of the space of the room. These painted corners directly spring from similar elements on the architecture below. And it is this impulse that gets carried forward in the idea of the Rococo fresco. Here at Schloss Schönbrunn, we have people standing on the cornice and then rising up to heaven. There's a lot of fake perspective going on here. There are certain vantage points where everything makes sense and other vantage points where nothing makes sense. Worth mentioning is another building type, which is common in northern places, and that's the wall pillar church. Different typology. It's an aisleless, tunnel-vaulted church with internal buttresses connected by small transverse tunnel vaults springing up at the same level as the main vault. Some other terms here are tectonic versus atectonic. 
and we discussed this a little bit earlier. Tectonic, its core word in the middle of architecture, this tect stuff, has to do with putting the pieces together and kind of clearly revealing the system of putting the pieces together. So tectonic reveals the constructional logic. A tectonic, A means not doing that. It's sort of like tectonic not, to put it in the language of you kids. Does that make sense to you when I put not at the end of it? And the A is baffling. If something like the Pantheon is tectonic, because we see the structural system, we see the joints, we see how pieces relate, then something like a Rococo interior becomes atectonic because those pieces are all subsumed into the froth of, of polychromatic stucco. Tectonic has to do with expressing the structural and constructional logic of the building. Atectonic has to do with masking it. <laughs> this is a lovely picture. This is a Rococo lady painted by Monsieur Jean-Honoré Fragonard. Look how fabulous she is. She's so pink. Her color palette is the color palette of Rococo architecture. Pastel colors, lots and lots of lacy, curly cue things, even a very lacy, curly cue dog there. And also this image gives us a glimpse into what it is to be in the Rococo period. It's a period where society is shifting. It's not simply a shifting of architectural styles. During the Rococo period, certain architectural developments came into their own, such as the corridor, the idea that you might want to have privacy and not have everybody marching through your bedroom is a Rococo invention. <laughs> These are just some nice things you would have if you were living at that time period. Crazy. So you can see why this rocaille, shell work idea came into play, because it really seems as though even something as straightforward in its structural sense as the leg of a chair becomes elaborately voluted for, for no apparent reason, except for the reason of making ornament. These are some historical ways of looking at Rococo. And as I said before, it arose as a pejorative term, as a way of somehow deprecating the qualities of this architecture. The OED is the Oxford English Dictionary. And if you're trying to find a dispassionate source that gives you just the facts, the history of the word, the definition of the word, there is no more authoritative source than the OED. And this is what it says. Having the characteristics of Louis XIV or Louis XV workmanship, such as conventional shell and scroll work, and meaningless decoration, excessively florid or ornate. So I would say the OED is not so dispassionate here. The OED is taking a strong stand about this stuff, and it's making judgments. Even Arnold Hauser, who wrote a book on mannerism that really began to say, this is not bad Renaissance. This is a different thing, and the thing that it is is good states that Rococo is the art of a frivolous, tired, and passive society. And maybe he's right. Look at her. She's ridiculous. There is an early work on the Rococo church that tries to individuate how it is something different from Baroque, the book by Ruprecht. It's quoted by a very interesting author called Karsten Harries, who's actually a philosophy professor at Yale, who becomes very, very interested in the Bavarian Rococo. The qualities that define Rococo are a central space is formed, illuminated mostly by indirect light. The boundaries of the space remain indefinite. Traditional architectural forms are transformed, isolated, and displaced. An ornamental stucco zone is placed between fresco and architecture. And a point of view near the entrance is most important. It determines the perspective of the main fresco. At the same time, it lets us see the space in its entirety as a pictorial whole. One more term to introduce is the notion of Gesamtkunstwerk. Great term. German, lots of syllables. What could be wrong with that? And Gesamtkunstwerk means total work of art. And this is something that arises in the Baroque period and that becomes a recurring theme as we move into, into modernity. Total work of art means architecture is a fusion of paintings, sculptural, decorative arts, and even music. And this is a little detail from a, a monastic church, Zweifalten, where you see the stucco work just going nuts. Angels pulling out of the curly cues, angels climbing out of the paintings, pulling up the drapery that this painted person is wearing so that they can climb out into the world. This is really great stuff. But also notice the asymmetry, that this is not about articulating. This is really about ornamenting in a very, very different sense. It's about the ornament becoming an autonomous thing, developing its own themes. And its themes almost are contrary 
to the clarity that one might expect in an architectural structure. Karsten Harries, as a philosopher, is interested in the Bavarian Rococo because he thinks it marks the last successful attempt to build churches as signs of the invisible church. What he means by that is it's architecture about a transcendental referent. It's about something spiritual and not simply about the discourse of architecture. The suggestion is that as you move even a few decades farther into history, architecture becomes so involved with the eclectic project of pulling sources from different places, of establishing meaning in architecture in a literary sense, that it doesn't behave in such an unmediated way as the Rococo did. Harris continues to say, the playful way in which the sign character is attempted shows that this is indeed a last attempt. Let me just show you this image because this is a fairly important image. This is a drawing from the linguistics book by Ferdinand de Saussure, where he's talking about sign and signifier. And for your convenience, he's doing it in Latin. The word arbor is tree in Latin. The word equos is horse in Latin. The tree is the thing in the world, and arbor is the word. The horse is the thing in the world. Equos is the word. He's suggesting that in the Rococo period, there is still some immediate connection between the sign and the signifier. A third element has not come in to break that kind of clarity. Now let's look at Balthasar Neumann. And Neumann, I think, could probably better be characterized as late Baroque than Rococo, because Neumann is still interested in the tectonics of the architecture, the expression of plasticity. But he's moving away from that toward this more decorative attitude about ornament. Balthasar Neumann. He's so important, he's on the money, or at least he used to be on the money. This is an old 50-mark no note with Balth Balthasar Neumann's picture on it, and this is the back side of that, where we have a number of his plans. I think his most spectacular church is a pilgrimage church near Würzburg. Not so near Würzburg, but let's... You don't even know where Würzburg is, but I'm trying to help you. The pilgrimage church called Fjordsein Heiligen. Fourteen saints. And if you would like to call it Fourteen Saints for my purposes, that is fine. If you like German, you can call it Fjordsein Heiligen. Here it is. And we're like a mile away or farther. You, know, you can see it from, from far, far away. It's a giant thing, and as, as you can see from these images, the scale of the facade and the scale of the building volume behind it are not commensurate. It, the facade operates like the west work of a Gothic cathedral. And by that I mean it becomes as large as possible, to be seen from as far away as possible, to become as rhetorical as possible. And notice also from this partial plan, Neumann has been learning from the Roman Baroque, or, or maybe from the Roman Baroque, as revisited through the eyes of Guarino Guarini. There is this interpenetration of concave and convex volumes that synthesize together to give us an undulating facade. As a point of comparison, I want to show you again Guarini's Santa Maria della Divina Providenza in Lisbon that we looked at before. We have this strategy being used by Guarini and producing a facade not so different from the undulating facade that we saw in the Neumann church. We have the strategy of shish kebabbing together spaces, shish kebabbing together ovalized and convex spaces, interpenetrating the spaces. These are diagrams from Christian Norberg Schultz, by the way. And if we compare Guarini's church over here with Fjordsein Heiligen by Balthasar Neumann, we see that there is a lot of similarity. Guarini introduces the idea of the church plan as a Latin cross comprised of serial domes, serial ovalized domes, and we get the same thing going on here. A dome, a dome, a dome. Even the transept in both churches is developed as another opportunity to place domes in the space. By the way, programmatically, Fjordsein Heiligen is a little bit different from many churches. It's a pilgrimage church because there was said to have been a holy vision on the side of the church. Legend has it that in 1445, a shepherd was wandering in the fields belonging to a nearby Cistercian monastery, and he saw a small child crying in the field. When he went to pick up the child, the child suddenly disappeared, magically. And a short time later, he saw the child again, this time with two candles burning next to him. And again, the child disappeared. A year later, he had his third and final sighting. This time, the child was there with a red cross and 13 other children. And the children spoke to him, saying, We are the 14 holy helpers. 
We would like you to help us and erect a chapel on this site for us. And if you help us, we will help you. They built the chapel, and suddenly there were recoveries and cures for horrible diseases. And from that point forward, it became an important pilgrimage site. Please take note of this list, because I'm sure all of you could benefit from someone to pray for when you have a headache or a sore throat, or if you would like to keep your family safe from discord, or someone to take care of your pets. Here's a reliquary, a place to hold relics in the middle of the church. You have these different domes being assigned quite different functions. The dome for the altar, the dome for the reliquary, the dome, well, kind of, kind of for the congregation. It's not a parochial church, so services don't happen quite in the same way. People are moving around, moving through. A lot of things are similar in the two churches. For example, as we said, plan typology, system of serial domes, similar. But I would have to say, much as I love Guarini, the Neumann church spatially is more interesting. I might say that because I've been to the Neumann church and the Guarini church fell in a earthquake in 1733, and nobody's been there lately. But also, I just would like you to look at the relationship between the space of the aisles and the space of the nave in both churches. In the Guarini church, it's really clearly delimited. You understand that you're in the aisles. You understand that you're in the nave. And there's no blurring. It's really, really clear. Here, it is almost as though the structure for the central dome has pulled away from the walls and begun to give you a spatialized figure within the volume of the church. Now, in part, this could be that there are different plan typologies at play. There could be some idea of the wall pillar church here that invites Neumann to conserve the rectangle of the building while simultaneously giving us a dome. There could be some idea of the basilican plan here that invites Guarini to be very clear about the idea of center and perimeter. However, the effect is that you walk in here and you feel like you can simultaneously experience the interior volume of the central dome and the exterior figure of the central dome. This double, double figurality is something you really don't see until, say, high modernism. This is an axonometric. I find this extremely hard to read. I hope you have more luck with it. And what it's trying to show you is the way that this edge is developed. And the edge is incredibly complex and in how the series of vaults are developed. What's so amazing about this church is that light pours in through this plenum on the side. And the central figure is actually quite dark. So you get this sense of a kind of glow, further isolating and individuating the space of the nave from the space of the perimeter. And here again, we see things that we spoke about before, the idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, the playing together of all the different arts. Here are little pink angels crawling out of the pink angel land of the fresco. Here we see the stucco work asymmetrically masking the tectonic connection between this field that we know is hard to hold up, but we have no knowledge of how it's done. Surface is held together by these little tendrils. This is the reliquary in the center of the church, quite spectacular. And many of you by now are probably thinking that all the architectural ideas going on in Neumann are really great, but you just can't get, get past the glop. You think the glop is just overwhelmingly excessive and you just wish that there would be some way to appreciate this space without that? That's because you don't know anything yet. This is great glop. Look at the little angels. They're getting off that ceiling. They're getting off all over the place. <laughs> so one time I drove all the way to Lichtenfels to see Fjordsen Heiligen and the church was under construction. And so this is what I saw instead. So if you'd like to imagine the space of Fiat St. Heiligen as a perfect translucent Nisian box, here it is. Which is better? You be the judge. This is better. This is one of the domes at the transept where it really coagulates away from the space of the nave and becomes its own element with its own center. And one reason that I'm suggesting that we call Neumann late Baroque is that the orders are still so clear and the tectonics are still so clear, in spite of the fact that the structure of the dome becomes ambiguous and the play of the stucco work further veils the clarity. Here's a reflected ceiling plan. This is the basic guts of the plan, and this is what happens on the upper story where all of this uh, elaborate work comes into play. One more Balthasar Neumann church for your convenience. This is an abbey church called Neresheim, which I think is great. And again, giant thing see it from far away, 
with the facade detaching itself from the volume of the building and having this characteristic undulation derived from, let's say, San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane, or, or Guarini, or both. I really like this church because it's more monochromatic, and it might be that they just didn't have as much money, or because it was a monastic church, they were trying to be less ostentatious. But there's something about the whiteness of this church that I think lets you read the space better. The polychromy at Fürth St. Heiligen gets in the way. Long nave, and an interesting idea about a Latin cross plan, putting the crossing of the Latin cross in the center so that you simultaneously have a centralized church and a Latin cross church. Fabulous. And it's a monastic church also. So the notion that there would be extended spaces beyond the crossing makes sense in that typology. Here's the dome. It's a really great illusionistic perspective taking the space of the church as a point of departure. Notice how some people are falling into the church and other people are rising up to heaven. And these illusions only work from certain vantage points, I might add. Here we are looking toward the organ, and here we are looking toward the altar. A lot of the qualities of this church are similar to the qualities at Fiat St. Heiligen. That is to say, we have this illuminated plenum of space that's washing the center with light from a source that we are slightly pulled away from. And there's the thinnest space in here. You can walk through it, but just barely. That gives you, again, the notion of domed figures floating inside of a hall church. Super similar again in this shish kebab of space. Neumann, in the town of Würzburg, also did a palace for the elector. The residence, that's what you call the palace. Residenz. One thing that I think is spectacular about it, and as good as architecture gets, is the stairway. This is giant. This, the stairway takes up this entire space, or you might even say takes up this entire space since you land here and start here. Here we go. This is the entry piece right in here. You move up the stair. Here's a landing. You move up the stair. Here's a landing. And you can also walk along the sides of it. So it becomes theatrical. It becomes like boxes in a theater that let you look down and watch different people move up through the space. It's really quite amazing. And another thing that's so great about the grand stair at the Residence in Würzburg is that the ceiling painting is not done by some ordinary painter, but rather by a very important painter, Tiepolo. This is an example where you have all of the arts at the highest level. You have Neumann's stair orchestrating a procession that's incredibly intricate, and you have Tiepolo's ceiling painting. Looking at the plan typology, this reminds us of things we've seen before. Pop it in, get a court, pop it out, get a pavilion, and allow the court to organize the relationship to the town and allow the pavilion to sponsor the development of an axis into a garden. Here's the stair. And as you see the stair, you can see the play of this cornice and the, the pictorial elements within the space of the fresco. One of my favorite moments is where the dog gets out of the painting and stands on the cornice. Or tired people stick their legs over on the cornice. It's really, really great. We've seen this plan typology before. We saw it, for example, as early as the Barberini Palace by Maderno in Rome, where there is this kind of carving away of space for an entry and popping out of a volume at the far end. Garden facade. And maybe this is a better section of the amazing space, the amazingly theatrical space of the stair. What makes it so amazing is the view through the space, the view across the space, you get these incredibly long views. You get this sense of gaze, sense of engagement with remote people or remote objects through the space. These are some other moments within the Würzburg Palace. You see that spatial technique that we've seen before of a dome cohering in the middle of an orthogonal space and leaving this little plenum of light-drenched space that surrounds the darker domed figure in the center. And this is a chapel that Neumann did attached to the residence in Würzburg. It's the Hofkapelle. It's what we've seen before, right? A dome and a dome and a dome, a serialized dome that gives us this undulating ceiling plan and that gives us this separation of these figures within the rectilinear field. However, since it's the Hofkapelle, since it's the royal chapel, the materiality becomes more exuberant, more expensive, more elaborate. And a lot of these beautiful, rich, fancy marbles 
are not really beautiful, rich, fancy marbles. They're fake. You have these illusionistic artists that not simply paint heaven on the ceiling, but they also paint marble graining and wood graining and all kinds of elaborate material textures on, on elements within the church. Next time we'll look at some more Rococo churches like Steinhausen by Dominicus Zimmermann.